Hi, my name is Matt O'Malia, and I'm very pleased to talk to you today about decarbonizing building products. My background is that I'm a passive house architect, but most recently I have taken part as a co-founder in launching a large scale startup with a focus of manufacturing wood fiber insulation from wood residuals from the lumber mill in Maine. What I want to do today is talk to you a little bit about my background as a passive house architect and the motivations that sent me on a journey to launch and co-found a massive installation company. Um, and then a little bit about the products and their benefits, uh, not only performance, but sustainability. Um, talk about operational versus embodied carbon. And then show you some of the recent projects that we've been building, which utilize these materials with the goal of significantly reducing a building's carbon footprint. So as a little bit of a background, um, in 2008, I launched a design build company with a focus on passive house design and construction. As a design build company, we had the benefit of a very tight uh, loop of feedback from the site um, back to the drawing board, which allowed us to develop and understand a lot of the performance details that we were creating and their benefits. We also learned a lot about the materials that we're using and how the crews felt about installing them insulation specifically, which I think, as we all know, has a reputation which precedes it as being itchy, scratchy, and uncomfortable. As we built, uh, designed and built a variety of different passive houses all over New England and the Midwest, uh, what we started to realize, though, is that the insulating products that we're using, the mass market insulations, which consist, I think, as most people are familiar with, foam, fiberglass, mineral wool, um, are all non-renewable, non-recyclable, and in some cases, like foam, derived directly from fossil fuel or oil. There's a small margin of biogenic insulating materials, including hemp and um, cellulose, but those occupy only about 10% of the New England market. So as passive house practitioners, our focus was always to build a very cost-effective building, cost competitive with first cost, ideally, by increasing the insulation of the building shell and the performance of the building shell and reducing the mechanical systems. One of our goals always was to be as first cost competitive as possible. And with Passive House, that was always our leading strategy. But when we were looking at the building shell and increasing the insulation levels, basically going from code to Passive House in New England, we're using about three times the amount of insulation as standard construction. We realized though that we had a serious problem with the existing cost competitive mass market insulations and that they came with a very high carbon footprint to the, the project site. And what we realized when we started to model not only operational carbon through Passive House, but also embodied carbon through tally and life cycle analysis, we realized very quickly that through using these insulation products, we were just trading one environmental problem for the other in that we were saving operational carbon with insulation with high carbon footprints and the carbon payback of those materials was eight to 10 years. So as a passive house practitioner, though we thought we were doing the right thing with passive house and solving a real problem, which was the operational carbon of buildings, we realized the means to the end were, were not justified and we were doing it with all the wrong materials. That launched me into questioning the opportunities around insulation products and looked farther afield of what um, scalable mass market insulations are available that are renewable recyclable with carbon a uh, low carbon or negative carbon footprint which led us to find wood fiber insulation which was manufactured in europe for the last 20 to 25 years from there understanding that product and material we realized that it was an incredible opportunity to introduce that to the united states market to have a cost competitive scalable carbon negative alternative and that led to the launch of timber hp which is the insulation manufacturing startup. So what I'm gonna do now is go through a little bit about the specifics uh, on the product and the company where we are today to give you a little more information um, and then go on to some of the projects we've built. So as I discussed, one of my motivations as a passive house architect early on was to address of the 40% of total carbon attributed to buildings, the large two thirds of that, which was the operational carbon. I think most passive house architects agree that this is the low hanging fruit and the big opportunity in buildings. 
And I totally and fullheartedly agree that when we address carbon with buildings, we have to start with operational carbon. But one third of the carbon is embodied carbon, the, the carbon used for building materials. And I think what's interesting when we look to the future and we realize the success that Passive House is having on influencing the industry, the, um, the benefits of more aggressive retrofit programs and the incentives around renewable energy, improved mechanical systems. What will happen as we reach a net zero goal for operational buildings is the total cumulative carbon associated with operational carbon will actually flatline. Then when you look out in the next 30 years, the impact of the embodied carbon then becomes greater and greater as we continue to build new buildings, albeit buildings that are carbon neutral in terms of their operational carbon. So it leads us to this bigger question of the more successful we are as passive house practitioners, the more we start, to, we need to look now at solutions to solve embodied carbon because that will at some point eclipse the operational carbon, which in many cases I think is a wonderful thing because that means we'll have been tremendously successful in implementing operational carbon reductions. So as a company, when we started to look at the larger life cycle analysis and opportunity around that, Clearly concrete is that big elephant in the room that needs to be addressed in terms of total carbon footprint. I think that's well established, but one that's kind of lurking and sneaky um, and in my mind, very interesting is actually the opportunities around the carbon reductions associated with insulating products. This slide is from RMI and they've established that the potential for reductions in carbon for insulation actually is in fact of the greatest. And the key there is to think about going from high carbon footprint raw materials, such as foam, fiberglass, or mineral wool, and using a biogenic or carbon storing material instead. And what's also key about life cycle analysis, and I'm not going to go through the stages here today, but talk about what I feel like is a very important part of the portfolio of a, project, a product um, relative to its sustainability, is the actual end of life scenarios. Because what I feel we really need to think about um, in building products is of course using re low embodied carbon materials and minimal processing. But the key is the recyclability as well of end of life. And that's why when we're looking at the mass market of insulation, it's dominated by you know, insulation products that are extremely difficult or impossible to recycle. They all have high embodied carbon footprints in some cases with the foam products, they trap moisture when used in above grade assemblies, particularly in conjunction with wood construction and on and on. I don't need to tell you about um, the reputation of some of the insulation products out there. So looking at then going forward, how do we introduce a product into the marketplace that improves that? Whoops, we came across um, wood fiber insulation, which I think when we're looking at the alternatives specifically around the carbon footprint of these insulation products is that uh, wood fiber insulation being biogenic is actually carbon storing, which um, to begin with, it has a very low carbon footprint in terms of its actual processing, being a natural fiber with minimal processing, but the carbon stored in the product actually makes it carbon negative. So there's a great opportunity um, when replacing wood fiber insulate when replacing the existing uh, insulation products with wood fiber insulation. Now the carbon storing really goes back to the middle your middle school science class where you talk about the sequestered carbon through photosynthesis, carbon being the building block of the tree, and then that tree with the potential at its end of life being um, processed into building products in wood, or in this case, insulation to make structures. Now, Looking at this diagram, you might be led to, led to believe that if, when we're making wood fiber insulation, we're gonna be taking virgin timber and creating it directly into insulation. That's actually not the case. I'll go into a little bit more detail about what we're actually doing, but we'll actually be using the residuals from the lumber industry, which are the byproduct or the waste stream from milling round logs into square boards um, and adding a value add supply chain. So. I think that's part of the, the forestry story going forward in terms of sustainable utilization is to create um, a high value chain throughout all the um, components and residuals of the lumber industry. Now, wood fiber insulation has been on the market for 20 to 25 years. 
It's around $700 million gross sales in Europe. There's a variety of um, large, well-established insulation company uh, manufacturers. And in fact, there is incredible build out of capacity in Europe right now with additional six plants coming online in the next two to three years, which will actually double the insulation, wood fiber insulation market in Europe. What is important to realize and understand about insulation in general is that it's high volume, as in it's very big and fluffy and low value, and, which means by definition, the exact opposite of an iPhone, it does not ship well. So thinking when we first came across wood fiber insulation of importing it as a solution to the North American market was clearly nonsensical given that uh, those relationships. So that allowed us being located here in Maine to look closely at the state of Maine. Once we discovered wood fiber insulation and started utilizing it on our projects, we realized its benefits, not only from performance standpoint, but also the handleability. And we realized it's a great fit for the wood construction market. And we also realized it's a great fit for the forest reserves that we have, not only in Maine, but across uh, the Northern North America and the Southeast forests. Specifically, we have abundant softwood um, forests, which are the basic feedstock uh, for wood fiber insulation. It's also important to note historically, when we were looking at this, pro starting this project in 2016, we had lost six paper mills in that year alone, um, which was from an economic impact, a devastating blow to the main economy of $1.6 billion, a negative impact, um, which for you know, a state that's already poor um, and an industry which was already compromised due to declining paper industry and demand, um, it was really a very difficult uh, situation. And that's when we realized when we were looking at wood fiber insulation being produced um, domestically, specifically in Maine, that there was a great opportunity given the massive amounts of results that were available because the paper industry and to large extent would use the residuals from the lumber industry. As I said before, we're not taking for the most part virgin timber, we're taking the offcuts from the lumber industry and processing those into chips, into fiber and into products. The other opportunity around wood fiber insulation, however, is to take the low value um, timber out of the forest. So when, when um, lumber is harvested for timber or um, studs or trim or finish, they, they will typically remove the high value timbers, which are straight um, with the greatest po possibility for lumber yield. And they'll leave the tops and the slash in the forest. Now that's another opportunity for value add um, in the industry, providing um, more products from the forest to sell, which diversifies the offering. It's also an important opportunity for the West where slash um, and tops are often um, a sort of key um, component of the fuel that's um, resulting in forest fires out there. So having a better, um, more diverse um, ability to harvest the forest um, is not only good from a carbon standpoint, but it also from forest fire and, and improving the, the ecology of those harvests. When we're talking about wood fiber insulation that we'll be manufacturing domestically, we're talking about three products. We're talking about a, a, a fill product, which is a drop-in replacement for cellulose, um, a bat product, which is a, re a replacement for say a mineral or fiberglass bat. The bat products are press fit, um, very similar to mineral wool. And then an, a board product, which is a continuous exterior insulating layer. The key thing to note about these products, in addition to their performance being competitive with the standard insulations in, in the market, is that they are carbon storing with a carbon negative footprint, high performance. They're highly recyclable at end of life. There's very low additives. It's 95% wood for the most part, and they actually perform well in terms of flame class. So they can be used on a variety of scale and project typologies. Starting with the timber fill insulation, this is a blown in cellulose replacement. It is treated with borate, so it's very similar to an all borate cellulose. The borate is a flame retardant and a mold and mildew and insect inhibitor. It handles and installs very similarly to cellulose um, and can be used as both dense pack and loose fill applications. 
The bat, as I said before, is a press fit. It has a higher density, so it acts actually very well when it comes to sound transmission classification. So it can use, be used for demising walls and acoustical applications as well. So sort of very similar to mineral wool. But the differentiator is that when you cut and handle this material, the byproduct is just sawdust. So it's easy to use, no gloves or respiratory is necessary, very comfortable. Um, it also, through the density, has the ability to reduce wind washing in cavities. So it's very efficient insulator, not only from an R value standpoint, but also from um, air movement in the stud cavity. The final board, and to me the most interesting, is the wood fiber insulation board. Uh, it can be manufactured in a variety of thicknesses, up to nine inches. Um, it's incredibly easy to use and install. The, the handling, as you can see here in this image, it's installed with a nail gun or screw fasteners. To cut it, you use typically a circular saw. Uh, and again, like all of these products, the byproduct is just um, sawdust, biodegradable on site. So no mess to manage, no irritants to hand the effect when handling it. I think that also the most important performance characteristics of wood fiber insulation, specifically as it relates to the increased requirements for building code, is the fact that um, it performs very much like Gore-Tex. We call it the Gore-Tex effect in that it's windproof, waterproof, but vapor permeable. So we're very focused on all uh, wood assemblies where we're using the same products to insulate our buildings as we are to um, for the structure and the sheathing of those um, structures, but also with that, the benefit of this using having the same material is the way that they handle moisture and manage moisture is also the same with permeable layers that don't trap moisture in the building assembly, but allow any um, moisture gained in the assembly to breathe out either to the exterior or to the interior. Um, wood fiber insulation has a perm rating um, around 40, um, which uh, makes it uh, a very durable and robust exterior um, uh, insulating material. Um, it's also uh, very durable when it comes to exposure. It's rated for three years, uh, I'm sorry, three months on site when installed. And based on the projects that we've built, and um, we've had wood fiber insulation exposed both on wall and roof applications for that time period and have seen no degradation of the material. So very, very durable to handle. One of the interesting aspects of wood fiber insulation that really motivated us to go from considering importing or using it selectively to really thinking uh, and believing that it's important to start manufacturing it domestically was the fact that we can be uh, cost competitive with the standard insulation products in the market. We realized this early on in the process of developing the company when we looked at um, the cost of the wood residuals in Europe, where it had obviously been traditionally manufactured, versus the wood cost residuals in Maine, which were about three to four times less than Europe. In Europe, wood fiber insulation was a premium product um, sold selectively for um, more or less high performance uh, or sustainable building construction. But we realized that if we could be cost competitive with the mass market insulation products uh, or close to it in the case of fiberglass, then what we really are talking about is introducing a highly sustainable building product that could scale and replace a lot of the mass market insulations, given that it wouldn't have a price premium. It would have the performance characteristics, the handleability characteristics, but at the same cost as the mass market insulations. And that's when we realized that this was an incredible not only opportunity around sustainability, but also um, investable in that we would be able to raise sufficient funds for the scale of the undertaking, which I can assure you is massive. So as we're preparing to get into production in 2023, so next year we'll be phasing production um, of the loose fill in the first quarter, the bat in the second quarter, and the board in the third quarter. We've been preparing ourselves with all the necessary testing, and we'll have the products will have full UL listings. 
Um, we've also been working in conjunction with the University of Maine on on-site testing in terms of the hydrothermal performance with moisture metering, temperature metering throughout building envelope um, assemblies. Um, shown on the right side is a small school that we built, um, CLT and wood fiber as a demonstration product in Belfast last year. I'll show you a little bit more about that product, but we've been getting incredible data about the how wood fiber is managing uh, moisture through the building assembly and the thermal performance. Um, so as we get closer to entering the market, we'll have very robust uh, test data and uh, I think understanding of, of the product and its performance characteristics in the marketplace. So one final thought um, when thinking about this dynamic between operational carbon and um, embodied carbon with these building products is for us as passive house practitioners, we firmly believe that it's important to start with reducing the operational carbon of the building using the passive house standard and, and including on uh, site renewables with a goal of creating a net zero structure. We firmly believe that a super insulated approach is the foundation for buildings going forward to do that. But as we look ahead, we also are extremely mindful of the impact of the material choices we're making, specifically around insulation, which I think is potentially the sort of greatest variable with a passive house in terms of additional information or insulation or um, carbon required to reach the standard. But what's also, I think for us, very uh, informing and illuminating is the fact that when we're talking about buildings, we shouldn't be just talking about new construction. Of course we should. We should also be thinking about the opportunity around renovation and when we renovate the existing housing stock, the massive potential of operational carbon savings. But when we do that, it's quite critical that we do that with the right insulating materials, because if we do not use carbon storing materials, we will completely undo the value and the benefit through the high carbon footprint of those insulating materials that we do install to the operational um, gains that we see. This chart here shows in the dark green and light green, um, the operational and embodied carbon of all, assuming sort of a moonshot here of all new buildings being built to the passive house standards and the, um, the impact of the embodied carbon uh, savings of the insulation products alone and the operational savings. As you can see, it is exceedingly small compared to 10% of a renovation of the existing stock. Now, of course, I'm not naive enough to believe that we have the policy ability and wherewithal to in implement this sort of renovation or that it would be feasible. But I do think by point of illustration, when you look at the opportunities around buildings and savings, it really is in the renovation opportunities. It's about future carbon, operational carbon savings. But as you can see by the light yellow bar, if we're not doing that with materials that have a negative carbon footprint, then the amount of carbon and the setback to those savings is absolutely massive going forward. So it really is about aggressive passive house policies, both in new and renovations, but it's to, to use the correct materials, buildings that perform well from um, a building performance standpoint, but also perform well environmentally from an embodied carbon footprint standpoint. So from there, I want to move on just a little bit about the triple bottom line of this project. You know, Timber HP was co-founded by myself and um, a chemist, uh, Josh Henry. We're two unlikely, probably entrepreneurs when it comes to a large scale industrial manufacturing project. But I think what we shared was a passion for helping to drive change, but to drive change, not just for the sake of the building industry and for providing um, improved building products, but also to drive change in our local communities and economies. In central Maine, um, this blue building here is the former um, New York Times paper mill. It's owned by UPM and closed in 2016. It's 200,000 square feet. Um, and it was an incredible operating asset. It provided many, many jobs in the community directly, but also for the forest and lumber industries, providing um, the materials and the trucking. 
to for the um, production of paper. And with that loss in 2016, it devastated the local town of Madison, Maine. When we came along, we were able to buy this, um, the paper mill in 2019. They were in the process of removing that paper making equipment and sending it to China. By the way, that was the 24th paper machine they had sent to China in the last 12 years. So there's a trend here. And usually what happens in Maine when a paper mill is shut down and the paper making equipment is sent to China, the rest of the building is scrapped and becomes useless. So we entered into the equation at the right time to maintain the value of that um, incredible asset. In addition to the paper making equipment um, facility, we were also able to hire on the former head of projects, electrical and mechanical maintenance, kind of the three key individuals who ran the former UPM mill. And they helped us with the planning and reviving the mill by where we'll be installing our wood um, insulation manufacturing equipment, which it really is large scale composite manufacturing. And I just have to say that the incredible ability of these, these individuals to be able to plan and manage these incredibly large scale and complex projects is, is really inspiring. I'm an architect. I thought I was pretty good at project planning. What I realized what they can do with um, industrial engineering and planning is just just the level of complexity and, and difficulties is so much greater than, than an average building. So really incredible experience to work with these individuals. Um, the Madison Mill, um, for us to be able to build out the entire plant with working capital is $130 million. So it's a massive undertaking. Um, it required significant um, private equity investment up to 30% of that. And the rest of our financing was handled through a tax exempt recycling bond from city, which we closed last December. Um, we will have, we will, when at full capacity, have 125 people, um, both on the office and production staff. Um, and we'll be using around 235,000 green tons, which is just about half the amount of uh, green tons required uh, as when it was pa making paper. So we're thrilled that we were able to intervene before this uh, fantastic facility was, the value of it was completely removed. Um, we're in the process of building out the project right now. This is the site. The dark green is the uh, area of the mill. In the front yard, which is a rather tight little triangle, um, is where we'll be taking our raw materials, the softwood chips, and processing them um, with a refiner. Um, when you look at the layout of the factory, there are three production lines, as I said. There's a loose fill line, which basically takes the basic processed fiber with borate added to it and packages it very similar to a cellulose sort of packaging system. Um, that's actually quite small scale and straightforward and it can manage four to five tons an hour. The next line, I don't know if you can see my cursor is a bat line, here, uh, a bat line which is in yellow. And a bat line shares the fiber stream from the refiner and dryer um, that's used to make the loose fill. And it is then formed and mixed with what's called bicomponent fiber, which is a poly strand, which is a plastic core and an outer adhesive shell that gets mixed in with the fiber. It, that fiber gets formed into a mat and goes into an oven and gets baked. And the external adhesive shell gets uh, adheres to the adjacent fibers. And that gives it this sort of mechanical property of, you know, very similar to a, like a mineral wool bat. At the end of the processing line, at the end of the oven, it's cooled and cut and then pal um, packaged into bundles and palletized. And then we have a, an additional refiner dryer for the board line where we will be mixing in a little bit of paraffin and a little bit of adhesive, which is very similar to Gorilla Glue uh, in total 4% by volume. And that board, uh, or th those fibers uh, mixed with the paraffin and adhesive will go into a former and then into a, what's called a continuous steam press, which is a very similar uh, operation to making OSB or MDF. And so traditional wood composites manufacturing. Um, and at the end of that, there's a processing and packaging line. In general, the overall length of this, it's actually quite massive. It's around uh, 150 meters long. This is the Madison Mill with an animation provided by our engineers of what we will be um, installing onto the mill. 
Um, and what you can see here, just in summary, is a chip shelter conveyors into the refiners where the chips are refined into a fiber. That fiber comes out of the refiner with 100% moisture content and then goes into this tube along here, which is uh, called a flash tube dryer, where we'll introduce hot air and a, a large fan to tumble dry all that fiber where it goes in about three to four seconds from 100% moisture content down to 7% moisture content. The fiber then comes into these two large silos where the fiber stream itself is separated from the exhaust gases and the steam. And then those fibers, uh, that fiber stream is then packaged um, in the loose fill or the bat line. And then the second stream is obviously going to the board line. So large scale manufacturing, a lot of complexity, a lot of build out. Um, and we're tremendously excited about what that means for the community and creating quality jobs and bringing back these incredibly important assets um, uh, and jobs to, the, to these communities that have been hit so hard. We also see Madison as a template for future plants going across the United States because it can, to be sure, Madison and Maine aren't the only uh, wood baskets that have been hit hard in the last 15 years. So I want to shift gears now to a couple of projects that we've been building um, that really focus on the utilization of wood fiber insulation, I would say probably as a demonstration, but also um, importantly um, to reduce the carbon footprint of the building products we're using. We've also been focusing on mass timber and um, exploring different applications for that, both small, small and large scale. So this first project is a small residence. Uh, it's a bit of a laboratory type project that we did um, in Connecticut. It's a 1300 square foot house and with a little boathouse and garage. It was an existing non-conforming. So the shape of the structure and the footprint was based on the original cottage that was removed and rebuilt. Our, we used CLT as the construction system, which was an unlikely candidate given the complexity of this building. But what we really wanted to explore with this project is the exact, or the ability of manufacturing um, CLT components using an export from our BIM modeling into um, CNC production. KLH is an incredibly sophisticated company when it comes to their manufacturing capabilities. And we had an incredible experience um, working with them, being able to take our three-dimensional information and exporting it actually to the specific, uh, each specific panel. The project um, was then, as you can see in these details, the CLT was coated with wood fiber insulation. We were close, but we didn't exactly reach the passive house standard, um, but we did have a focus of having on-site renewables, which I'll talk a little, about a little later. Um, a lot of this project was really focused on sort of a design exploration and using these new technologies. Um, we had a fantastic client um, that was, was game to work with us to really sort of implement and try out these innovative concepts. So this you can see is the CLT construction um, in process. It took three days to install the CLT. Um, it was a really quite successful. The level of exactness of the panels was to the millimeter despite the complexity of the geometry. Um, we then took that complex shape and we clad it in wood fiber insulation, as you saw in the details. Um, the wood fiber insulation, this was one of our first kind of larger, thicker applications where we had um, nine inches and uh, 16 inches, uh, nine inches on the wall, 16 inches on the roof. Um, one of the interesting lessons learned was while the um, CLT uh, installation went extremely quickly. The wood fiber installation was rather time consuming um, and conventional. So we realized, and I'll talk about in our next project, how can we then add more value to the CLC, CLT processing going forward? When you look at the math on using all wood mass components, I think it's that's where we are, we're getting pretty excited about really being able in a similar fashion to calculate embodied carbon footprint as we calculate operational energy or carbon in passive house. So with the combination of mass timber, wood fiber insulation and other finishes, we have a total global warming poten potential reduction through these products being carbon storing. 
which we can then offset against the other um, building products, such as concrete. We did use mineral wool insulation below grade, and not to mention with glass and windows, um, aluminum for the exterior cladding and so forth. But by offsetting those, we were able to reduce significantly the total carbon footprint of the projects. We're very interested in a zero carbon building. I'm not exactly sure how to achieve that given what we know about how carbon footprint is calculated using the stored carbon as an offset to high carbon footprint materials. So therefore, what we're thinking about is an integrated approach where we look at the carbon footprint of the materials and reducing that to the extent we can, particularly offsetting using carbon storing, carbon negative materials in wood. We're thinking about minimizing our operational carbon um, for the building performance and then using on-site renewables. In this case, we had a very tight little complicated building form. It was not well suited for a large solar array. The Tesla roof had just become available in New England and we realized from an aesthetic and performance standpoint, it was actually a really great opportunity. The scale of this PV cells lends itself well to integrating with the look and feel of obviously more traditional construction, but it also allows the module of the PV array to fit onto much uh, more complicated uh, roof shapes and building shapes allowing us to significantly increase the amount of PV area that we would have if we didn't, if we weren't able to use such a small PV module. We also have, as you can see in the lower left, a Tesla wall backup. Um, and this is, is actually not because we're trying to do net zero with batteries because we find that prohibitively expensive, um, but it's because we couldn't install a generator because of sound limitations given the tight site. So PV system, and what you can see below in the graphs is what I think is quite interesting, the uh, total energy production by facade. And what, what you realize is we obviously foc focus on the south facade for um, PV production, but the, the east and west and south um, still actually have uh, con contribute a significant amount of energy to the total. And um, using a, a material like the the, or a product like the test wall, wall allows uh, that sort of to happen in a way that's, I wouldn't say necessarily cost effective, but realizable and integrated with the architectural expression. So when you look at it all together, we're thinking about the total energy loads for the building based on our modeling, and then the annual production of the solar tiles in terms of carbon emissions. And then, our ability to then have a surplus of solar production based on our sizing, including the Tesla charging. And then when we take that and we look at it relative to the combined in body global warming potential and the operational global warming potential overlaid by the annual energy production, we actually are able to get to um, zero at around year seven and a half and then carbon negative at year eight and every year going forward. So for us, this was a great demonstration product relying heavily on not only passive house modeling, but carbon um, footprint analysis, life cycle analysis. And I think for us, we've, we've learned a, a tremendous amount about what the potential is to be able to make uh, carbon negative buildings going forward in the timeframe that that's uh, achievable. Just a few images, uh, Tesla roof, um, that's thermary siding, so it's a heat treated siding, really beautiful product. The exposed CLT on the interior, concrete slab, which obviously helped contribute to our carbon footprint. And then a little writer shack, so just some of the sort of design um, opportunities we took with an uninsulated building uh, in, in the case of this writer shack. The next project I just want to look at quickly is um, what kind of a result of what we learned at the Connecticut project, the CLT wood fiber insulation product. As I said before, the CLT was uh, extremely efficient in terms of its um, design, cutting, uh, manufacturing, and insulation. What wasn't efficient was the additional layers of the insulation. So what we then did with this project, um, and we actually prototyped it in our Madison mill, is um, we 
found, we were able to work with a former client and build a middle school for them. We had, a few years before in 2015, we built uh, a Montessori um, elementary school and they were, their programs were expanding and they wanted to build a middle school sort of annex edition is what we called it. And so we built this very simple or we designed this very simple thousand square foot shed. Our goal was to panelize it using CLT and wood fiber insulation manufactured in the Madison mill as a demonstration product. Um, we wanted to realize what opportunities and efficiencies there were in this process, because the goal would be to have this full wood assembly that with a highly automated manufacturing process. And with one of the big opportunities and benefits was all the production offcuts that we would have um, in making these panels, we could actually grind up and recycle it and turn into insulation. So a zero waste stream opportunity. So we came up with this very simple design. Um, we went through great detail in modeling each panel and component um, down to the screw attachments and how we fasten the CLT components, as you can see through when we're combining to a roof and a wall, how we install screws through that thick layer of insulation. So a lot of innovation around thinking about the assembly and the process. The project went extremely well. Um, we didn't quite reach the passive house standard, as you can see here. Um, but what's interesting is the thermal performance um, that we were seeing from the University of Maine is actually it's significantly outperforming the energy model, which we has we, we think has a lot to do with the thermal mass of both the wood, the CLT and the wood fiber insulation. Um, when it comes to the carbon story here, again, we're have a, we have a significant amount of carbon reductions um, based on the stored carbon in these materials. And when you look at um, the high, the carbon footprint of the materials minus um, the stored carbon in the wood fiber insulation CLT, we came out with a, a total global warming potential a global warming potential for the embodied carbon of 11.2 ounces, which in, in contrast to the national average is, is significantly, uh, significantly lower. So again, we're, we're excited about, you know, what the math tells us. Um, this project doesn't have a renewable PV, um, the existing school does, but that's, that's our next step is to, to achieve net zero with that. In terms of construction, as I said before, this is a bit of a, a prototype and we did it in the Madison, on the inside of the Madison mill before we started our build out. Um, managing large piles of pre-cut insulate uh, CLT, which is quite heavy um, in conjunction with the wood fiber insulation, which is also heavy. Um, we have these very mass, heavy mass panels. Um, the installation, this is a, a roof panel shown here, went together extremely quickly and efficiently. Um, and we were able to install the entire school, get it dried in and completed in just two days. So I think from our standpoint, we we're you know, extremely pleased with the efficiency of construction and have a number of projects that we're building um, in the same vein. Now, finally, just briefly, I'm, I'm sort of getting short on time here. So this is just a, an example of a project that Opal Architecture and Susan T. Rodriguez collaborated on for the College of the Atlantic. Um, the College of the Atlantic is in Bar Harbor, Maine. It's a fabulous campus with incredible sustainability goals right on the Atlantic Ocean. And we were hired collaboratively to design the Center for Human Ecology, which is a 20,000 square foot building, arts, science um, labs, classroom mixed use program. We had targeted passive house for energy production, air sealing. It does have a PV array on site um, and it also utilizes uh, mass timber uh, construction. Our goal based on COA's previous projects and what we thought was realistic was 24 kBTU with renewables. And we were actually, uh, our final tally for the, for the school was actually 11 kBTU. So significant improvement um, on model EUI relative to standard construction. That was enabled by a PV array on the roof um, but obviously didn't get us to an EUI of zero. They do have additional PV production on site for the college, but we were focused on just the sort of 
uh, on-site, on-building uh, PV production. In terms of materials, there's a variety of construction, including local stones, but also wood, both in the cladding, the construction with glue lamps, mass stack, and wood framing. In addition to that, we had a six inches, six and a half inches of Gutex insulation installed over the entire exterior, which is for us a great um, example to see uh, kind of a large scale institutional project using wood fiber insulation, totally allowable by code um, for the scale project. Um, so a, a great demonstration. And also really interesting to get the uh, contractors uh, feedback, definitely a commercial contractor. So um, kind of a unique perspective. The interior um, was lovely, light filled, incredible connections to the surrounding um, site, including the Atlantic Ocean. Um, a lot of open spaces for congregation, a lot of transparency within the building. Um, one of the great design features was the fact that the shape of the building was able to embrace an existing oak tree and the oak tree survived the construction. So that's sort of very important careful siting relationship that was developed. And um, it's been in use for, I think, a year and a half uh, and performing very well and in great feedback. So we're, we're extremely pleased. So Opal Architecture, that's my architecture firm. Opal Build is the construction firm that is doing the panelization using CLT and wood fiber insulation and then Timber HP is um, I'm a co-founder where we're with the startup of manufacturing wood fiber insulation. So I appreciate everyone's attention and taking the time to hear these ideas about uh, insulation as it relates to passive house and thinking about this larger picture of kind of closing the loop on sustainability, both from an operational and embodied carbon footprint perspective. Thank you very much. That was awesome, Matthew. Thanks for that great presentation. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you all for joining today. Um, we've got a good group in here, about 60 individuals, and you've been doing a great job of answering some of the questions in the chat, but I thought maybe we could go over them a little bit. Um, would you maybe speak a little further about the recyclability of the product? It sounds like you have some really innovative programs planned. Yeah, I think the recyclability of wood fiber insulation is actually, uh, despite the feedstock and the carbon storing, contributes to the carbon storing is the recyclability. Um, again, it's important to keep in mind, we're talking about three different product lines, a loose fill, a bat, and a board. They do have, as I mentioned, slightly different production uh, requirements and characteristics. Um, but what, we, what we're looking at doing is basing our recyclability, pro, you know, the recyclability of it based on the European model. Um, and some of the more interesting uh, producers, for example, Schneider Holtz, um, they have a, a program that we're going to model, which is they send um, containers to the job site to collect any offcuts or any over orders. Um, and then they take those back by weight and then provide a credit to the builder. And I think it's the, the reason they do that is because it's in their best interest, um, because they can obviously obtain uh, a good quality um, raw material obviously the the you can grind up the wood fiber insulation board and use it in processing again but it also is an incentive obviously for the builders to be mindful of being able to recycle that product completely and not have to put it into you know anything in the landfill and so forth so being able to close that loop is i think a really key uh, aspect of what they've done and, and what we plan on doing going forward Clearly, we need to get into production. We need to walk before we run. So we're going to be working our way into that. Um, but we do think, you know, the ability to recycle this material is completely unique amongst insulation products, save uh, cellulose, of course, which, of course, is only 10 percent of the market. Um, but, you know, we, we feel that that's going to really be a game changer in the industry, um, particularly around life cycle analysis. Mm -hmm. Well, and kind of piggybacking back on that, um, there were some questions about the, re you know, the recycled content in the product itself and like sourcing that. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you foresee happening in the future or what the goal is for the recycled content in the product? Yeah, the it's, it? in, there's a lot of layers to it. And that's why I think this is, this becomes also a little more complicated, but nonetheless interesting. 
For example, um, the reason we were able to get the debt financing we did, which was a tax exempt recycling bond through city, was because 80% of our feedstock is going to be an industrial waste stream from the lumber industry. So the offcuts um, of taking round logs, making them into square and rectangular shapes, all the offcuts from the logs are our waste stream. So it's recycled. So that was one criteria for the bond, which we will continue to do going forward. A lot of that recycled content used to go to the paper industry. The paper industry across the United States, obviously, as we all know, has faltered. Um, so we do need new value add um, production, which can provide uh, a, a sort of a, a productive uh, use of those materials and not landfill them or in the West. In the case mm-hmm. of the West, they're sending them to China at the moment. Um, the other aspect of it is end of life or even during the process of, of fabrication. When we're cutting, shaping, uh, for example, the boards, any off cuts, any uh, extras will grind up and return back into the production as part of the fiber stream. And then, of course, end of life, um, thinking about how we can have programs where we can capture any non-use products during construction, but also end of life, how that can be then brought back into the facility. The other opportunity from a raw um, material standpoint point or feedstock material standpoint is actually recycled timber. And when you look across the United States, there's very different levels of recycled, uh, recycled timber available. For example, in Massachusetts, there's a very robust market for recycled wood through a lot of the demolition that's happening around uh, residential structures and kind of rebuilding and densifying. So there's, there's, a, there's a big opportunity of being able to start to develop um, uh, a use of that waste stream with um, kind of value add products like wood fiber insulation. That's great. We got a couple of really great questions here coming in on the chat. Um, Gabriel asked if you could talk about wood fiber insulation and code. Is it a, considered a combustible material and are there limitations on its use in large scale buildings and commercial, great, commercial uses? Great, great question. So uh, again, we're talking about three products. Uh, the, the loose fill and the bat share the same fiber stream and the same treatment with the borate. Um, we actually have a class A flame spread, and that actually will allow us to be able to use the bat and the loose fill in most any project. Uh, obviously, there's specifics in terms of its encapsulation within walls and so forth, but it is a class A. So it, we feel that that has a great opportunity, particularly in the multifamily space, particularly the bat with the mising walls. We are going to be coming in around 20% less expensive than a fiberglass, or uh, I'm sorry, a mineral wool equivalent, which obviously has a very uh, high performing sound transmission uh, classification. And so, you know, I think the, the loose fill and, and the bat, I think are gonna be interesting in a whole variety of projects. Uh, the board product is a class B. We don't treat it with any fire retardant. That is something that we plan to develop going forward. There's a lot of work around that uh, in Europe, particularly by Gutex. Um, but at the moment, it's Class B. We'll go into the market with a Class B board, which means that it can be used for low-rise low um, construction, uh, residential construction, a, a, a pretty broad variety of project types, but not certainly not uh, large-scale, uh, larger-scale projects. As, as I showed, we did use it on the academic building, which is 30,000 square feet, but you won't be seeing it on the high-rise or, you know, sort of large uh, gathering or other types of, of assembly structures. At least not yet, right? At least not yet, um, thank you. Uh, Chris asked, if hemp fibers be considered by Timber HP in addition to wood fibers? That's a great question. Now, hemp fiber is quite interesting, and there are actually, there is production in Canada, and I think the, the West right now, using hemp fiber. Uh, the hemp fiber itself is extremely strong, durable fiber, um, which lends itself, uh, obviously, to bat production. Um, We won't be mixing the streams. It actually is rather difficult to process, if not cut on the job site, as maybe many of you have used. Um, But we won't be introducing that into our fiber stream just because the the type of fiber is so very different and and the machining of that and the, the production equipment wouldn't, it wouldn't manage it well. Um, But again, I think it's a great example of a biogenic material, fully recyclable. And we, you know, we're looking at wood fiber insulation, of course, but we welcome all the different uh, products uh, into the marketplace, which, you know, kind of represent the next generation of construction materials. Awesome. 
Um, I'm going to paraphrase Eric's question about uh, there's risk exposure from the weather on a job site. Like it's one thing about keeping it, you know, having good quality control in your factory. What are your recommendations about sourcing, shipping, and storage on the site before you install or protecting it when it's kind of a little bit vulnerable on the job site in wet or cold conditions? Great question. I think primarily when we're looking at that question, we're thinking more about the board product, which is an exterior sheathing uh, or insulation would be in, installed on the exterior face of sheathing. Uh, the loose fill and the bat briefly, they, they'll they come to the job site fully weather protected. One would assume that they'd be put inside the structure before they're installed. Who knows, you know, job sites are job sites. Uh, the board product on the other, other hand would be installed in the exterior face of the sheathing. It does come to the job site completely weather protected. Um, once it's opened and installed, the rating typically right now is three months. Um, the formula for the um, adhesives and the wax, which weather protect it, is very similar to Advantech, a product by Huber, which has a three month rating. Um, we've installed it on buildings and, and it's been exposed to the weather for six months or greater. And we've been extremely impressed with how durable the product is. Um, exposed in weather conditions, it's not supposed to be exposed to those weather conditions, but it really remain completely intact and is very durable. So it's a really robust product. Um, mm -hmm. I think when we started working with it, that was one of the surprises to us that it was so incredibly durable, um, particularly exposed to the elements. And so the by rating it's three months, but we've seen it perform extremely well in, in un, uh, unprotected applications. Great, one more question about your project carbon calculations. Um, did you use a cradle to gate or a cradle to completion um, approach to this? So A1 to A3 or A1 to A5, are you familiar with that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's also one of the frustrating questions for us to be perfectly honest. I don't know how, um, how much experience the group has here with carbon calculations and the specifics of this question, um, cradle to gate versus um, cradle to cradle. Um, the just in an overview when you calculate when you do a life cycle uh, analysis on a product a new product you have to use um, for example end of life treatment what's available in the current marketplace so it's pretty easy to understand that introducing wood fiber insulation to the north american market there is absolutely zero precedent for its recyclability because there is no wood fiber insulation so one would assume that any uh, wood fiber insulation currently will be uh, landfilled burn, you know, incinerated, whatever. Um, certainly not making the most of the recyclability of the product, but that's just the way uh, EPDs are calculated and that's fine, we understand that. Just a little frustrating because that's the game changer of this particular product. Going forward, obviously when, when there's precedent for the recyclability and we have programs, we'll be able to demonstrate um, with the data the value of the recyclability, but that's something that we won't be able to do in the short term, unfortunately. We can extrapolate about that. The, but back to the original question, we did in fact use um, cradle to cradle um, for our calculations, which limited um, the amount of kind of long-term sequestered carbon in those calculations. Because if we had done cradle to great, those projects would have been carbon negative um, by a long shot, mm -hmm. but that data is not available in the United States. So we use cradle to cradle. Got it. Um, all right, might be our last question here, but I'm gonna combine a couple together about your, how soon will your products be available? When will product spec sheets be available for download? And when perhaps could I get like a set of samples in my office of this great new product? Oh, I love those questions. So the first question is when is it available? Um, we are starting our first line of production, which is the loose fill, because as you kind of glean from this talk, that's the least treated, it's the, the most minimally um, manufactured, uh, that will be uh, first quarter of next year, followed by the bat, um, which will be the second quarter, and then we'll be manufacturing the board in the third quarter of 2023. So all products will be online next year. Um, as you know, we're manufacturing in Madison, Maine. Um, the, the loose fill and the bat don't ship particularly well because they're very high value, high volume. Um, so that's not as easy to send those uh, across the United States, but the board product we certainly intend to ship uh, across the entire United States. Of course, there's a premium for shipping, but we're obviously trying to make that as cost competitive as possible because we want to get it into as many people's hands as possible. 
Um, please visit uh, timberhp.com, which is our website, and that's where all the spec information um, and also updates on the production and the availability of the material will be uh, located. And otherwise, you can email me directly, and I'm happy to put you uh, in touch with our uh, sales team uh, to give you updates. Um, because again, we're, we're super um, pleased that people are interested in the product and we certainly um, want to introduce it to the market as efficiently as, as possible. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for this presentation, Matthew. We're really excited about this undertaking, the massive thing that you've done here. And we're really excited to be able to use your products in the future. Looking forward to that. Great. Well, it's my, my pleasure indeed. And, uh, you know, again, keep your eyes out for our products. And we hope uh, that, uh, you know, that's well received in the U.S. because we do think it'll, it'll help move the needle towards more sustainable construction, very much in line with passive house thinking. I know we're really excited to be able to source this product nationally instead of having to import it. So thanks so much for these efforts and thanks for presenting today. My pleasure. All right.